Ah, welcome back to Special Effects in a Time of Quarantine. This week, an introduction to pneumatics, which is French for you will never spell this. So why do we care about compressed air in special effects? Well, when you want to move something, using air is quick, cheap, clean, easy and powerful. What is not to love? We're primarily going to use it in one of three ways. Firstly, in the form of an air cylinder or actuator. Secondly, we're going to directly propel objects in such things as a potato cannon or a golf ball cannon. And thirdly, to induce wind or draft. So, if that's all, let's get to the replay. While we're talking about compressed air, it's important to note that not always are we talking about air as the gas. We might also be talking about CO2 that, say, would power this paintball gun. Reason being, this is about half full of liquid CO2 up to about here. And this has 860 pounds per square inch, which is a lot. And it's also very portable. Doesn't make a nasty noise like a compressor. If you need even, even more dynamic situations, you could use nitrogen, which gets up to about 2,500 pounds per square inch. The important thing to remember if you do use a gas other than oxygen, oxygen, air, is that all your fittings, your air cylinders, your valves, your regulators, all need to be equipped to handle that amount of pressure. Otherwise, kablooey. You don't want to do that. So, Two things to consider with compressed air, pressure and flow. We'll talk about pressure first, which is what you will read on a little pressure gauge like this. And in the United States and pretty much nowhere else except for Myanmar and Liberia, it's measured in pounds per square inch, which it means if I blow this balloon up, I, my lungs can generate probably about two PSI. So right now, there's between one and two pounds per square inch pushing out on, on every one of these square inches, on every one in between as well, there is, between, there is between one and two pounds per square inch, which is what gives this this form. Just to confuse you, there is in fact more like 16.7 pounds per square inch pushing out, but there's 14.7 pounds per square inch pushing in because that is atmospheric pressure at sea level. Barometric pressure. You may have seen it referred to as an atmosphere. If you're a purchaser of waterproof watches, it'll often say on the back, good to 10 atmospheres, which is 10 times atmospheric or barometric pressure at sea level. So that'll tell you how far you can go underwater before the water gets in. So uh, the metric way of measuring pressure is in pascals, um, which is, incidentally, the amount of force um, one newton exerts over an area of one meter, it's one square meter. So instead of one pound, a pound, this is about a pound, on one square inch, it's one newton over one square meter. And as an aside to that, a newton is the amount of force gravity exerts on the average sized apple. You can't make this stuff up, can you? What the rest of the world does use for pressure, to, regular, to measure pressure, because Pascals, though they're very exact and very scientific, the average car tire has about 30 psi in it. And in Pascals, that's 207,000 Pascals. So they're kind of annoying. So the rest of the world, apart from the US, Liberia and Myanmar, uses bar. B-A-R, or come from barometric. So it's nice and simple. One bar equals 14.7 PSI, which is the weight of a column of air reaching up to the stratosphere that is exerting down upon me. It's also exerting like this and like that, so I don't actually feel it. So, balloon, one PSI. Car tire, about 30. 
skinny bike tire, probably 70 to 80 pounds per square inch as a rough range. Next up, flow. So, choke points. In the world of special effects, quite often we want a lot of air delivered very fast in one place, all at once. We don't want to trickle. Sometimes you might be doing something where it slowly releases or moves something, but most of the time it's a fast, dynamic, action-packed thing that you're interested in. And so we want all the air at once. Now this is a Flexilla hose. Very nice, very flexible, even in cold. Doesn't kink very easily. But the ID, the inside diameter of this, is only three-eighths of an inch. So the air coming from my compressor, which is miles away that way, has to go through a thin, small, bendy tube to get to me. That causes a lot of friction, and while the pressure might be there, the moment you open the valve, the next bit of air is somewhere over there, because the inside of the... that's kind of what the size of the inside of the tube is. And even worse, it has one of these on the end. I'm sure you're familiar with these. I mean, I love them, but they are terrible at letting air through. Let me give you a demonstration. Three tea lights. I have here a quick disconnect, both sides of it. Now, when you blow through one of these, the amount of noise you hear is a good indication of how much resistance is going on inside of here. Because as, as you say, as I say, as you say, there is no hole directly through this. You can't see through it. So when I blow, it makes a, makes a hissing noise. So I'm going to try and blow that candle out. I mean, obviously, I can cheat doing this, but why would I? I can, but it takes a bit of puff and it makes a lot of noise. Secondly, you may have seen people using these. It's, a, it's kind of a blow-off valve. It's a hand valve. Um, very useful for blowing things off, but uh, for triggering stuff, again, where you want lots of action to happen at once. Again, hear that noise? Eventually. Same size tube. Now you can see through this. This is what we want. We want a clean tube. We don't want to have any restrictions, any choke points, any none of this going on. Okay? So get rid of these if you can. It doesn't matter if you, well, the, the way to get rid of them is you use an accumulator. So right next to where we want our air to be, you would put an accumulator. An accumulator could look like this. A five gallon tank. And as you can see, it does have a quick connect on it. But that's for the inlet. So I can fill this slowly. I can use a small compressor. I could use a compressor this big until I've got five gallons of pressurized air at maybe 100 pounds per square inch. And then when I want to use the air, I'll put a valve on here and there's no restriction. I could stick my finger all the way through there and get it stuck probably. But and I, I could also weld a larger fitting on here. So I had a much, much bigger one, but this is, this is pretty good. This is a half inch fitting, so it's slightly bigger than a half an inch on the inside. No restrictions. Another kind of restrict accumulator you can make if you have uh, a smallish requirement for air is just to use a larger piece of tubing. I don't have... Well, let's pretend that's a piece of tubing. You could make something like this, and now we've got that will be filled with 100 pounds per square inch of air, and there's no restriction. Obviously, we're going to put a valve here. But when I want that much high-pressure air, I actuate this valve, and it goes blam. Uh, and we can fire something or make some very dynamic situation happen very, very quickly, which is, again, the fun part of doing special effects. You could also, and I have done this, um, make them out of PVC. There is a slight issue with um, PVC in that it is not as strong as steel. So you want to be careful. You need to make sure that the PVC you use is rated for pressure. Because this, in fact, is not an accumulator. This is something else, um, 
I don't know what it, what it is, but it's in fact, though it looks like regular PVC, it says for drain, waste and vent only, i.e. it is not pressure rated. If you put 125 pounds per square inch into this tube, capped at both ends, there's a possibility it will explode because it is not solid PVC. It is foamed PVC, has a foam core and a thin skin on either side to make it cheaper for drainage purposes. So always make sure, check you're using pressure rated PVC or steel. That accumulated tank down there, I bought from Harbour Freight because you can see it's a high quality tool shop brand or maybe Menard, I forget whose that is. Um, that's good for 125 pounds. So that will be a safe level to use it at. It would not be safe to put CO2 in there or nitrogen because eventually it will rupture and again, bad things will happen. So moving on. So what are air cylinders? Well, this is one. This is a one and a half inch diameter air cylinder. And that's an important number, the one and a half. Because what it is really is a piston inside a tube. This is a three inch diameter tube. And the piston, with this end capped, if we put air in here, will push the piston out. But with how much force, you ask? Well, this is a three inch diameter piston. And for every square inch of area of this piston, if we put 100 pounds in, 100 pounds per square inch will be acting on the piston. There's clearly more than one, so it's going to multiply the amount of force we have. So let's work out that out. It's three inch diameter. For those of you who like visual learning, you're in luck. So the area of a circle is pi r squared. Pi times the radius times the radius. And you can see here, the radius is half the diameter. Remember that from algebra, not algebra, geometry. Um, so the radius is 1.5 inches. 1.5 times 1.5 equals 2.25. 2.25 times pi, which for reasons of ease, we're going to call 3.1416, equals 7-ish. So we've got 7 inches, square inches of area on the piston if the piston is three inches in diameter. So if we put 100 pounds in per square inch, those seven inches will work out to be 700 pounds. So we put in 100 pounds and we get 700 pounds of force out of it. We like that. The opposite is obviously true as well. If we have a tiny air cylinder like this, this is a quarter inch air cylinder. So it has a, a surface area of the piston inside of 0 0.05. So if we put in 100 pounds, we'll get five pounds of force out. So it's reducing it. And if you wanted to scale it up a little, let's say you wanted to flip a car, or how about you wanted to flip the uh, semi truck in the dark night in downtown Chicago, where it, it goes over. You could use something this is only a six inch cylinder. I believe they're usually much larger with cylinder than that. So if we do the similar kind of math, on a six inch circle, we have an area of, I worked it out before, 28 square inches. So if we put 100 pounds of air into this air cylinder, assuming it's got a nicely fitting piston in here and a shaft, if we put 100 pounds in, we're gonna get 2,800, 2,800 pounds of force back out. If we use nitrogen and we used 2,000, well, let's say, let's say it was 1,000 pounds per square inch, we'd get, you're right, 28,000 pounds of force out of a thing this big. And obviously if you use a 12 inch, which is probably what they use, a 12 inch diameter piston, you could quadruple that. Um, there is a link to that making of flipping the truck in the uh, section below. And we're gonna go and look at valves. But not quite just yet. One important thing about air cylinders, cylinders is they come in two basic varieties, double acting and single acting. A single acting air cylinder is like this one. It has an input at the back. You put air in here, it does this. And this one is spring loaded. So it returns on its own free will. A double acting cylinder allows you to power it in both ways, more like a hydraulic system on a, on a 
grader or an earth mover where it can lift and push. So uh, I've rigged one up here. Uh, if you, well, if you look at this, this, this is the input for pushing that way. And this is the input because the piston is here. If we put air in here, it will push the piston back and the air will come back, back out this way. We can see that in motion in this very simple demonstration. I have two valves being supplied by air from my compressor. Yeah, and we do have air. And each of these valves is electronically, well, electrically operated. It's a solenoid valve. One is putting air into the back and one is putting air into the front. If we add a timing relay that switches these off and on and off and on, you hear that? That's off. That's on. So if we give it some air, so quite a useful thing to do. And if you added, uh, these are, the pistons are normally magnetic or they have a mag magnet in them. So you can strap a reed valve or magnetic reed valve to this run it into an Arduino or simple programming um, setup and you can limit how far you could have it so that it would just go backwards and forwards very small amounts, set in, basically set in limit switches at either end. Um, and then you can control the speed by putting in a reducer, or rather a needle valve, so you can control the speed of one as opposed to the other, so it could go out fast and come back slowly, stop in a certain point. Um, ultimately controllable. Now it's time for valves. So we're going to start with the best kind of valve, which is a distant valve, i.e. you are nowhere near where the action is taking place. You're sitting in a deck chair behind a nice protective wall of some kind and you flip a switch and whatever you want to happen happens and you're quite safe from any retribution from your equipment. So you may have noticed that the um, piston we were just toggling backwards and forwards, was going pretty slowly. And believe me, there was 120 pounds of air coming into this system. But this solenoid valve, which is a 120 volt operated solenoid valve, is very small. The orifice inside of it is tiny, probably the size of a toothpick. So it's very hard, and it's not a straight line either. So it's very hard for the air to get through, much as I showed you earlier when I was trying to blow those candles out. The air goes in, it wiggles around through some little orifices, then it comes out the other side. So it's going pretty slowly by the time it comes out the other way. So if you, this is fine for doing control work, moving a piston slowly, but if you want to move a piston fast or you want to fire something or lift something or throw something, you need to step up your game a little bit. Um, so this is it's still in the 120 volt variety. This is one we used um, last week in the breaking glass segment um, to fire a slug at a piece of glass. This isn't bad, um, but still it, it, there's a lot of restriction. So if you want to fire a golf ball, for example, you might want to use something more like this, where again you can't see through it, but I can see the path that the air is going to take. There's a lot of space in here. I can actually operate the valve with my finger. And I can mentally I can see the, the way the path goes and this is again triggered by a solenoid um, that's this guy here um, magnetically that clicking noise is it operating it's very cunning actually um, you can see there's a little dimple a shaft rather um, in the casting here what it does it uses the let's say there's a hundred pounds per square inch coming this way and you've got your effect on this end, it uses some of that air to operate the valve itself. So it's only operating a tiny valve which cascades and uses air to open the bigger valve. So it goes boom, boom. Um, too quick for you to be able to tell that it's doing that, but that's how it gets away with having a fairly small magnet attached to it, electromagnet attached to it. You can also get, a 12, this is a 12 volt operated solenoid valve. It's very handy if you needed to wear it for some effect. Um, <clears throat> because you could run this off eight AA batteries 
and trigger it with a switch or remotely. This is again a 12 volt um, air operate, electrically operated solenoid valve, slightly larger. You would probably not, you'd need more oomph than eight AA batteries. Um, you might need some kind of small uh, lithium battery to power this because as you can see it, it's going to take a fair amount of juice to operate it. But again, 12 volts um, and waterproof, I believe, if you use the proper seals, which I have not done in this case. So there's one other thing about valves, which is important about solenoid valves in particular, is that they come in two basic varieties, much like air cylinders. They come in two and three way operating valves. A two way valve is on and off. So the air is stopped here. Second, or, second way is the air is open and it, go, it just goes straight through. It's like a, a faucet in your bathroom or any kind of, any kind of simple switch. It's on or it's off. A three-way valve, which is what these are, has another setting. Well, not another setting, but another, another process. The air comes in like this. It's stopped here. But at this point, the air on the effect side is able to go through here. So it can, it, it, it can exhaust itself to the atmosphere. When you fire it, this closes, or rather opens, and the pressurized air goes straight through, and this is shut off. When you turn it off, the pressurized air is stopped, and again, any buildup of air here can escape into the atmosphere. Um, and the reason why you would do this is if you had a cylinder, an air cylinder, and you attached it to a, to a two-way valve, you go, you turn it on, it does this, whammo. You turn it off, this is still full of pressurized air. You cannot push it back until there's a way for that air to get out of its own way, which is why you'd need to have a three-way valve on an air cylinder. This would be most likely to be used if one was, say, firing a golf ball. Put that in there. The air goes into the tube and it has an opening. The golf ball flies out. This is open to the atmosphere. So you can just put the ball back in again and fire it a second time. So that's the difference between, you could get three, four, five, six way valves if you like, but that's the main difference between two and three way valves. And next up, we're gonna look at ball valves. Ball valves have the advantage of having a dirty great big hole right the way through the middle of them. These come in two distinct flavors, like everything seems to these days. Full port and standard port ball valves. A standard port ball valve, still has some amount of restriction. You can see it actually gets smaller. The ball is not the full size of the tubing itself. A full port ball valve will cost you considerably more and they are a little girthy around the metal because they have to accommodate a bigger ball that has a hole drilled in it. This one, as you can possibly see, has a very large hole compared to the diameter of the tube itself. So this will give us the best effect. It might cost you twice as much as a standard ball valve, but this is what you want. What you don't want is this kind of valve. This is what you might find in a garden hose. It's got no hole, no direct hole going right, right the way through the middle of it. Not only that, when they, the director says action, this is how long it takes you to undo the valve. Now we're fully open. These open much more quickly. They are, in some instances, you can do it by hand. If you've got a long line and you're pumping blood, the reaction time's not gonna matter quite so much, so that is gonna be acceptable as a quick-acting valve. Uh, they obviously come in as, you know, you wanna spend more money, they come in giant sizes and become very difficult to turn. This one, is again, is a standard valve in the the hole is big, but it's not as big as the tube. So there is some restriction here. Uh, I imagine a full port ball valve of this, which is a two inch uh, pipe size, it's probably gonna run you a hundred bucks, maybe 150. It's a lot of brass and a lot of precision machining needs to go into that. So uh, the, that's what you would, you would wanna use if you were gonna be, again, if we were firing a golf ball out of here, you would have your um, chamber, with a ball, ball in it, the barrel, I suppose. Then next to that would be the valve. 
So there's no restriction past this. And then on this side would be your accumulator. Um, so this raises the question. We want to fire this using a ball valve very, very quickly. So how do you think we're going to do that? We're not using electricity because solenoid valves, for all their fun and easy ease of use, they don't let the air through nearly as fast as we would like. We want to have nothing. I want to be able to stick my finger through the valve itself when it's open so that we get every single PSI doing its job. So think about that for just a second while I check under the table. Well, if any of you thought maybe we could use an air cylinder to open this valve to operate an air cylinder, give yourselves a pat on the back. It's going to take me, uh, well, basically what we're going to do is we're going to do this. We could leave it at that, or you could watch me do a time lapse of the probably 20 minutes it's going to take to hook this stuff up. Maybe we'll do that. I'll press the stop button now. And welcome back to the hands-only version. What I've done in the intervening 10 minutes is put together this little operation. Uh, our valve, our full port, port ball valve here, is in line with what we're going to assume is an accumulator on this side, and maybe it's firing something out of this tube. I just, just I put a long pipe on it so I could screw it down to the table more easily. Now the handle of the valve is attached to an air cylinder. The air cylinder, through this through these quick, dis quick disconnects goes to an electric solenoid valve, which is connected to the air line from the compressor. So the solenoid valve is connected to this power line. The power line goes under the table, comes back up to the switch. So when I flick the switch, the power goes to the valve. It opens the valve. The air rushes through this little tube and it's on the front side of the, it's the front port of the Bimba air cylinder. So it will cause the air cylinder to retract very rapidly and our air will be released. At least that's what it says in theory. So three, two, one. Now the interesting thing about this is this is a two-way valve. Uh, if it was a three-way valve, because right now I can't get this back because though there's no more air going through this valve, there is still pressurized air in here. So I'm going to have to release the pressure by doing that. And then I can retract it and we can start the whole process over again. So again, we go three, two, one. And that's faster than I can do it by hand. But most importantly, I can be somewhere else. Um, I could be looking at a monitor by the director. I could be operating another effect entirely. So that's how you would do that. And obviously you can scale this up to very, very large valves with very great pressures with nitrogen in them, 2,500 pounds of pressure with a much bigger cylinder. You might end up putting a cylinder like this. And at which point, this doesn't need an accumulator because it's a very small valve, a, a, a very small cylinder. A larger cylinder like this, you'd have a equivalent sized accumulator so you'd get a very fast reaction. So a quick word about potato cannons and the like. So you're going to need a lot of air. The bigger the tube, the bigger the projectile, you need exponentially more air. To fire a soccer ball, you need a 20, 30 gallon accumulator tank and a compressor that can fill that up in the reset time that you have. Um, for firing a golf ball, which comes up every now and again, people like to have golf balls go through windows and as part of a plot or for an insurance commercial, whatever. So in this instance, um, golf balls are this one anyway, this is a tight list tight lies. I don't, I don't play golf. Uh, 1.67. Uh, the nearest tube I can get is probably going to be, gonna be yeah, more than three quarters. So there's a bit of a gap. And we don't want the ball rattling around in there because all the air is going to get past it and get wasted. So we're going to use wadding. And that can be as simple as in this case, this is a paper towel, which we'll probably do. I'll probably normally use a piece of, piece of thin fabric. Um, and that makes it, oh yes, nice tight fit. And then you might need to ram it in. The advantage also of doing this is that not only does it fit and be very efficient, 
I can aim down without the ball falling out. Second thing is, although we've talked about, you need to remove all the restrictions. The last thing before the barrel itself should be the valve that opens. And that would either be, it might be sufficient to do it with, with a solenoid valve. I might choose a larger one than this um, and have it an inch or two away. Probably would be better would be to go with a ball valve, a full port ball, ball valve. This is probably overkill, a smaller one would work. And you can either operate, operate it yourself or as we just saw, you can have an air cylinder operate it. I would probably end up using this. And I have used this uh, or similar um, solenoid valves. And then your accumulator would be here. And for a barrel about this big, you'd probably want to have something two or three times the volume of this barrel over here. So you might as well use a five gallon tank because generally they're nice and easy and convenient and you can buy them. You don't have to make them, which is a delightful thing. So that would work just perfectly well. Um, the only other thing I can think about, um, think of um, to do with shooting things, whether it's a, a, a golf ball or a, a ball bearing through a window or whatever, is aiming. Everything looks cooler when you have a laser involved in it. So in this case, what I've done in the past and what people tend to do is you strap the laser in a way that allows for some flexibility for some movement to the barrel itself. You'd want to obviously allow for the fact that it's going to drop a little bit, so aim down a little bit. But you don't have to be perfect. Because what you do, you, you lock this down, you put it on C-stand, you bag it and bag it and bag it with sandbags, make sure it's not going to move when it fires. You fire it. Well, first of all, you put the laser on where you think it's going to go and mark that point. Piece of tape, bit of sharpie, whatever. Then fire the ball. Wherever the ball goes, it's going to miss the laser. Let's say it's four inches down and six inches to the left. You can just use that. So next time you put the laser on it, go up and across four and three inches and you'll find your spot. Because obviously the camera wants to have a nice place to aim for where the ball's going to go or whatever it is you're firing. So this just makes it self-referential. You don't have to keep, you don't have to have the laser be exactly where the ball is going to end up. Providing you know how much it's off, you can just adjust for that to save you a bunch of time. And you get to use a laser again, which is very cool. Use a green one. They're much more visible in daylight. Um, and you would probably need to make yourself a little XY movable feast here so that you can adjust, get some adjustment. Because obviously if it's eight feet off to one side, that's, you don't want to be out there with a tape measure trying to measure it all the time. If you go, oh, it's just up a little bit or just to the left a little bit, that's normally good enough. Good enough for government work, of which there isn't very much in the special effects field. So, uh, the dull, boring part. Threads and fittings. Did I say boring? It's the most fun part of the whole show. So, um, the threading on pipes, on steel pipe, is a little bit of a conundrum. This, for example, is a three-quarter inch bolt. It is three quarters inch in diameter. If you put a pair of calipers on this, it says 0.74, close enough to three quarters. However, this is a piece of three quarter inch pipe. Notice I said pipe, not tube, pipe. The three quarter inch bolt fits in it and slops around. No part of this is three quarters of an inch. This is a piece of half inch pipe. No part of it is a half an inch. It's about 0.65 on the inside and 0.84 on the outside. And that varies. It is not exact. Uh, so that's one way it's a little confusing. Quarter inch pipe is not a quarter inch in any, any way, shape or form. Nor is three eighths, one and a half inch, two inch. None of it is. It's uh, designed by plumbers to keep you out, I think. Anyway, so that's one difference. Two completely different ideas about sizing. Um, tubing, this for example is, um, I don't know what this is, let me have a look. This is two inch tube, it is actually two inches in diameter. It's got an eighth of an inch wall on either side, so that makes it, guess what, one and three quarters inches on the inside. It's exact, it's always exact. If it was steel it would still be exact. That is not the case with pipe. Pipe and tube, completely different things. 
So we come to pipe thread, the bits that connect to each other. On a quarter inch bolt, a quarter twenty bolt, a five sixteenth bolt, a three quarter inch bolt, the thread is flat. That means you can put a nut on here and wind it all the way up and all the way back, which seems logical, don't you think? However, pipe thread, I don't know if you can see this, I'll put something in front of it, maybe that'll make it focus. It's slightly tapered, meaning this thread on its matching part is also slightly tapered. The idea is they get to a certain point and then they stop and the two surfaces mate together and make ideally a water or airtight seal. So you cannot mix, even though sometimes fine thread looks like it's a bit like this, fine threaded bolts, they were not the same and they will not work together. Um, when you are using, this is, this is called black pipe normally, if it was galvanized it would be called galvanized pipe, but this is just black pipe, plumbing pipe. Um, you need to put some tape, you can also use goo, but goo is disgusting, it's plum plumber's goo, it, it's sloppy, it never dries, um, it gets all over your hands, it's disgusting stuff. So instead you use Teflon tape, and the point of Teflon tape is one, it allows for less friction between the two metal surfaces, and two, it fills in any gaps. So every time you do this, I'm not I would use a wrench and tighten this up properly, but if I undo it, you'll see it's worn away in places, and ideally I should take this off, if I was going to do it again. I would take it off, uh, I'm not going to take it off, I would take it off and put some more on in its place, to make sure I have a leak-proof seal. So normally when you're dry fitting, as they say, um, any kind of plumbing for uh, pneumatics, what I normally do is put it together without using any tape at all. Make sure it all fits so I don't waste a bunch of time putting tape on things. And then when you're ready, you go back and you do the entire lot with tape, with Teflon. <coughs> Stuff is very cheap. It takes a little bit of a trick to get used to using it. Basically, the idea is you put the tape, obviously, on the male section of the pipe, and you go in the direction that the thread goes. So it doesn't unwind it when you screw it in. Does that make sense? It takes a little while to get used to doing it, but once you have that hang of it, it's quite pleasing. So uh, another way of joining things together you've seen me use is press fittings, quick push to connect fittings. These are one of the most delightful things in the world. You put them together, that is now airtight. And I probably could pull it apart, but it's pretty hard. But if you retract the little collar, there's an O-ring in there which releases. Um, they come in every size and shape. They come in different diameters. You can connect them to themselves. They have Ys, Ts, um, and it's so quick, so easy. Uh, you can cut this stuff, which is pretty cheap, with a pair of scissors. To length, you buy it in big rolls, and bingo, it's attached, airtight, almost every single time. I would say 99.999999% of the time, it does not leak. If it does leak, it's because something is worn out in here, or you've got a very bad cut on the end of here, or it's very old and dry. But marvellous, marvellous stuff. They're not that expensive. They come in plastic, they come in brass, they come, in, as I say, in different sizes, different pipe threads. A marvellous and marvellous invention. What else do we have in the way of threads and fittings? Ah, regulators. Sometimes you want to reduce the pressure. For that you need an air regulator. Most often they look like this. This part here with the... My main brain is going... with the gauge on it, with the pressure gauge on it, um, is the bit that is doing the regulating, reducing the pressure. So as I screw it down, the pressure increases. It's the opposite of um, a faucet. As you unscrew it, it lets more air through. Uh, the second part of this is actually an oiler. If you're using mechanical tools or air cylinders, it's actually not a bad idea to have oil, an oil mist going through it. 
The only downside to that is all your airlines will then have oil in them. If you ever want to paint anything, you have to use completely new airlines, different airlines, and keep them only for using for paint. You never want to obviously have oil and paint mixing in the same lines. Your paint will look terrible. Um, you can get all kinds of, this is a much smaller regulator. Um, you can get things that are not regulators, but which also restrict the flow of air, but they restrict the flow, not the pressure. The pressure will remain the same. So if I was filling, and this is a, this is a flow regulator, it's basically a needle valve. Inside here, there's a small hole with a needle that is cone-shaped. And when you turn the handle, it pushes the needle in and restricts the, the flow. But again, the flow, not the pressure. This, same thing. It will reduce the flow. So if you have a constant volume coming through, you can adjust that. But if you had, let's say, we had air coming from the compressor into this, going into an accumulator, I could restrict the flow, but eventually it's going to, there's going to be 125 pounds of pressure in that tank. It's just going to take longer. If I use this, I can adjust how much pressure I have in the tank. Two entirely different things. So another quick word about threads. There are many ways, uh, adapters and bushings, within the black pipe, plumbing pipe world, to allow you to go from large to small. But do not ever try and use one of these to, for example, connect to a CO2 tank. It will not work. Bad things will happen. Uh, this is a proprietary paintball type thread and fitting. Same way that this is for propane, for a 20 pound propane tank. It's a left-handed thread. It's very, very specifically meant for propane. It won't fit an argon tank. It won't fit an oxygen tank, an acetylene tank. Those all have their own special um, fittings. The idea being that you don't get yourself into a lot of trouble that you don't need and can't get out of without there being an explosion or flames. There are some other types of um, pipe threading. This, for example, is a compression fitting thread. But if you put a regular NPT, this is National Pipe Thread, if you put a regular NPT thread, though it looks the same, it is very slightly different. And this, again, is a flat thread. This is a tapered thread. So there are also compression, flare fittings, um, there's several other ones. But again, the, the, the rule is if it doesn't seem like it's fitting, there's a very good reason why it isn't. And if you keep doing it, you're going to get into a lot of trouble. So be careful. So we spend a lot of time talking about air inside things, inside air cylinders, inside golf ball cannons, for example. So you can also use compressed air to blow things, to make them look like there's a wind or just to move them. So you could use any number of... These are blow-off tools. The weak point of all of these is, as I showed you earlier, is the trigger. That one, I can barely, barely get any air through at all. These are designed to dust, dust off equipment. So they're not very efficient. There's another kind, though. Um, this is a Venturi. This is what's also known as an air amplifier, using Bernoulli's theorem that the faster air goes, the lower the pressure. So there's a nozzle inside here. Um, air comes out very fast, lowers the pressure bizarrely. And as a result, it sucks more air in through these holes. And what you get is a wider, slightly slower, but a wider, more voluminous current of air like this. And this has, still has the same cruddy valve. So can you imagine what this would be like if there wasn't a 3 8 inch hose all the way to my compressor and this cruddy valve here? It's loud, but it makes things move. Um, if you, I've used these for, um, to make hair blow. And generally, you, you use a, a ball valve to control them. Um, get a lot more oomph that way. Another way of doing this is to use... A bigger Venturi, this is a part of a um, air mover I'm in currently making, which is basically uh, a Dyson fan without the $700 price tag. It is a ring of copper tubing. Again, I have, I have I, for convenience, I'm using Quick Connects. This is not the right way to do it. There will be a, valve, a proper ball valve on this. Um, 
but there there are tiny holes you probably can't see them drilled in here out of which high pressure air comes um, there is then a covering a tubular it looks like a giant trumpet um, that extends like that which is like the thickness of a Dyson fan and it induces through Bernoulli's theorem again induces a draft and you can also then throw dust leaves whatever you like into here and blow them gently towards somebody uh, this isn't going to work very well because it needs actually a fair amount of air but you get the idea it's uh it's quite gentle but it's very wide quite pleasing. Um, I'm making a smaller one of these too which we'll use as the, the shroud we'll use this can of soup. We'll see how that works out. So in brief this has been an introduction to pneumatics. It is by no means comprehensive. There are many things I have left out, forgotten, never used. Um, some of it may even be wrong but it's my experience as I see it. Uh, the main thing to do is to be careful. Uh, using pressurized anything exposes you to some level of danger. Um, wear the, the correct safety gear, wear goggles if you need to. Um, be aware of other people. Be safe and have fun. Good night. <laughs>